my name is Raymond Johnlow. I'm a professor at the University of California at Berkeley. My own research area is in geophysics. I study the interiors of planets and the properties of materials at very high pressures and temperatures. But as an added area of work, I also uh, am interested in the interface between science and policy, and specifically in the areas of nuclear nonproliferation and arms control. So because of my interest in geophysics, my background in that area, and because geophysics plays a role in nuclear explosion monitoring in general, I have some long-standing technical interests in the field, but in addition, I'm quite interested in the linkage of how science can bring some capabilities to policymakers to monitor treaties and monitor activities around the world in support of uh, uh, nuclear explosion uh, test ban treaty. In the scientific community, conferences are absolutely essential for the progress of research because, simply put, um, there are two components to research. One is the discovery, the actual uh, finding of a new result through observation or through theoretical simulation, for example. But the second part of research is communicating those results. Without the communication, the discoveries amount to nothing. And so a conference plays an essential role in the technical community being able to come together, compare methodologies, compare results, validate each other's results, or find where maybe more work is needed to come to consensus on, on a particular issue. So in that sense, this kind of co conference is essential on, for the technical community. In my opinion, this conference plays a second role, which is really quite special, and so some might therefore say it's, it's even more important, and that is the role of connecting the technical aspect of the CTBTO's activities with the more political and policy-oriented aspects. This connection between scientists, engineers, the technical community on the one hand, and the politicians, diplomats, and the broader con uh, public at large on the other hand, that's a, a connection that is generally rather weak. We in the universities, of course, try to have some outreach through our teaching and so on. But here we're talking about a much broader outreach that has to involve journalists, politicians, the public at large. And so this kind of conference actually plays a, I'd say, uh, not, not quite unique, but very special role in helping the technical community link what it's doing back to uh, the broader interests of the public at large. Our lives are more than ever embedded in technology. We're immersed in technology. And even for technical researchers, it's sometimes a little overwhelming. We don't even have enough knowledge anymore to fix appliances or our cars or things around the home that easily anymore because the technology that is all around us is so sophisticated. Of course, it helps us. It facilitates our day-to-day -day lives. So that's uh, an example of how technology has sort of taken over our lives and as a result we technologists, the scientists and engineers that help create new technologies I think have a real opportunity in helping politicians, the public at large, diplomats when it comes to international relations understand how that technology can be used to advance political agendas, for example, s peace and stability around the world, these kinds of much broader uh, human agendas that we have. It's uh, an opportunity, but again, I'd say on the other hand, because that opportunity is there and because technology is inexorably just advancing very rapidly, it's, it's something of an obligation that we scientists also have to face, um, that we help ourselves and our nations and, and the world at large handle these technologies. Now I say that also with a little bit of an edge because some of those technologies empower us as individuals or as nations and as communities but can be used in one way or the other. The technologies intrinsically, I would say, are amoral, but the technologies can be put to good use and in other cases to rather cruel uses. And that's another aspect of technology that we in the scientific and engineering community should be aware of and in that sense uh, act responsibly in order to enhance the, if I may say, the positive aspects of technology while helping to warn against or to mitigate the misuse of technologies.
for researchers in science, medicine, engineering, sharing of information is absolutely crucial. We cannot move forward without sharing information. And that's even the first step of validating information. Someone discovers a, a new result, others have to reproduce that result in order to be sure it's valid. That means cooperating and sharing information. So in that sense, we feel very strongly that sharing of information is core to making advances. On the other hand, we also understand some of the constraints. When there is a treaty-based scientific effort, of course, there are constraints that have been built in for a variety of reasons. Uh, and my own view is it's uh, crudely analogous to the constraint that we all live under, namely, we can't do anything unless we have funding, unless we have money to actually get the work done. So it's uh, crudely analogous to, uh, yes, we'd always like more money and be able to do more work, do it more quickly. In the same way, we'd like to be able to distribute uh, information more freely, more broadly. But we understand it's part of the constraint of being in a treaty-based organization. It is a gold mine. I would really emphasize that uh, in my view, the international monitoring system, which is indeed focused on monitoring for nuclear explosions, in fact represents an important component of global environmental monitoring. And as you know, and as everyone here in, at the CTBTO in Vienna knows, the so-called civilian applications of the international monitoring system are just being discovered, you know, one after another after another, and the significance of these contributions from tsunami warning to being able to warn uh, the hazards from volcanic eruptions and so on and so forth, this is just phenomenal. And I believe we really have not begun to see how far the implications will reach for this kind of global environmental monitoring. My hope is that in the long run, what has started as a rather specialized focus on monitoring for nuclear explosions will grow into a very broad-based monitoring of the planet, of the environment, the air, the atmosphere, the ground, the waters of our planet in a way that makes life better for, for all humans around the globe. There are at least two different kinds of challenges. There are the ongoing technical challenges of maintaining the detectors and the systems, the uh, networking capability, the communications, and so on. And those remain as ongoing challenges. The CTBTO recognizes this and is well geared up to address and face those challenges. At the other extreme are, quite frankly, uh, we'll call them the political challenges of what good are these data? How will they actually be used in the real world? Whether it's to support a treaty that has entered into force uh, is one question. Of course, uh, we don't know yet when it will enter into force, how that process might come about. So at that political extreme, there are lots of intangible challenges, or at least from a technical person's point of view, much more uh, ch challenges that are much more difficult to characterize and to predict how, how soon they will be addressed. In between, there's, there is sort of a, a mixture of these two, which I would refer to as the networking of the scientific community. And this I really want to present in a very positive and, and uh, constructive uh, description in the sense that the scientific community really benefits from having um, people from very different backgrounds, different technical disciplines, different cultures and countries around the world, different backgrounds communicate with each other. And that kind of networking, do you call it a social networking? Do you call it quasi-political? Do you call it in, uh, exchanging technical detailed information? It's all of the above. So it's sort of a mixture of the two extremes of the spectrum that I started with. That's something that this conference has really been addressing, I think, head on. And uh, again, with a very positive reaction huge amount of enthusiasm and energy at the conference. It's evident you've got people really sitting from beginning of the day till the evening, uh, interacting with each other one day after the next and, and sitting through some rather long technical lectures sometimes with a lot of attention being paid to the details. So I'd say in this combination of the technology and the social interaction, this middle ground that's also essential for the research community as well as for the ultimate um, applications of the international monitoring system, this kind of conference has played a very, very critical role.
So there are various kinds of synergies, and let me start with the most technical level. One kind of technology, uh, seismology, which is a very uh, well-developed science for reasons of earthquake hazard mitigation and the like. Then there's another th technology, the, the uh, um, infrasound technology for monitoring sound waves in the atmosphere. At some level, of course, specialists realize in both cases you're talking about sound waves in the atmosphere versus the ground, but no one began to appreciate the richness of um, the, the science that would emerge from combining those two technologies when there are seismic stations at the same place as the infrasound sensors and vice versa. The combination of the two sources of data have been phenomenally enriching. When one starts adding in the radionuclides, which tells us something about the atmosphere. Oh, and by the way, of course, infrasound is monitoring the atmosphere in its own way. So all of a sudden we have synergies that perhaps the most um, visionary of the scientists sort of realized there would be some connection, but no one uh, could have hoped to anticipate how positive the connections would be. So those are very strongly reinforcing. And then all of the technologies of the international monitoring system tie in with interests and research efforts that are outside the CTBTO's domain. So there are various kinds of environmental monitoring, uh, there's uh, and geophysical monitoring more, more generally that ties in that are being pursued by, by countries for uh, hazards mitigations, by universities for basic research. There are huge synergies there. That's where one gets into some of the tensions as to who owns what data and how do you actually m merge the data sets together. How quickly can outsiders get their hands on the data from the international monitoring system since it's really very high quality information. Of course the scientific community wants to get its hands on that data and the flip side of that, of, uh, the CTBTO has experienced firsthand uh, that when there is a crisis, uh, a disaster, whether a tsunami or some of the consequences of a tsunami hitting a nuclear power plant, for example, then the CTBTO has a responsibility to, to respond to what are very dire and urgent human needs. And that kind of crisis response is something that, again, we in the technical community, hopefully working with the CTBTO, can learn how to improve how readily we can contribute to, to, to helping those who have been uh, hit by unanticipated disasters. I'm sure, uh, uh, sad to say, there will be more catastrophes, natural catastrophes of one kind or another, and all we can hope to do is to be better prepared to respond to them more effectively and, uh, and, and more thoroughly than has been possible in the past. Because we have had a moratorium on nuclear testing with just a few exceptions, a moratorium that has now gone on for close to a generation. There are some who ask, what, what is the added good of the treaty? And I think there are um, several answers. None of them, as a technical person, I can prove, but I think they're very powerful nevertheless. One is that entry into force is required to really complete the monitoring system and to actually put into place an on-site inspection capability. Everyone agrees that at the end of the day, that is part of the monitoring capability, both in a deterrent sense, but also as if you want an ultimate validation, it, it should there ever need to be one. Oh, and by the way, since the international monitoring system has been applied for other purposes than nuclear test monitoring, most recently to help um, monitor the consequences of the great earthquake and tsunami and the consequent Fukushima Daiichi disaster, one could even imagine on-site monitoring capability at some point helping out in responding to unanticipated catastrophes that have nothing to do with nuclear explosion uh, monitoring. Now that's a pure speculation, but one imagines as there's capability that is actually helpful for people in times of crisis and, and urgent need, one can imagine that this is something that CTBTO could at least advise others how to respond or help out or contribute to. So the on-site inspection capability is one important reason for entry into force. Another one is long-term, really, one cannot sustain the interests and the engagement of a technical community in a monitoring system that is not connected to a substantive treaty. If that was its purpose, now we do admit that the international monitoring system, because it's 
tied to a, a treaty and it's motivated by a treaty, it works under certain restrictions, for example, on access to data and the exchange of information. And I think the technical community understands and can accept that and may try and, and, and help modify some of these views, but it understands uh, fundamentally what those restrictions are. On the other hand, to maintain the engagement of the uh, technical community, whether within the CTBTO organization or more broadly, the, the general scientific community that provides much of a foundation or feeds into the CTBTO, I think in the long run, it's very hard to imagine that that can be sustainable if the treaty is not entered into force. So at least two reasons. One is long-term sustainability, and more immediately, I would say, is uh, establishing the on-site inspection capability and really exercising it as needed. The fact is that um, the non-proliferation regime, uh, as, as we understand it, really needs this reinforcement, this embracing of uh, the Comprehensive Nuclear Chest Ban Treaty for purposes of reassuring those who have already agreed that they will you know, forego pursuing advanced nuclear weaponry, for example. They don't necessarily want to forego uh, developing nuclear power. They may develop nuclear power in the future. Maybe uh, in, more, in some cases they're already planning to develop nuclear power. But the, uh, really it's those who are willing and able to work together cooperatively around the world that need to have some sort of mutual reinforcement. It's a comment, I, I feel, as a technical person, it, it's somewhat of an obvious thing, but it needs to be said time and again that the purpose of a treaty is to help bind allies and friends and to reinforce those alliances at least as much so as to uh, identify prescriptions and limitations on what others, adversaries, might not do. It's really more the idea of binding friends together. And in that sense, uh, the CTBTO uh, is, is doing, a, a, in, our, in my view, a heroic job of using science to provide another form of binding between nations in the area of nuclear nonproliferation. From a technical point of view, that I believe the CTBT is, can be monitored to provide effective verification. I want to be a little bit careful here and acknowledge that ultimately verification is a political decision. And when ha as, as a scientist, I have to respect that a political decision is outside and beyond the domain of science. But the underlying technical foundation, I believe that the monitoring is w easily adequate enough to make the CTBT effectively verifiable. I'm pleased to see that uh, an, an assessment along those lines of a few years ago, before the IMS was really up and running, um, that assessment, which was not just my own personally, but, but shared by many, has turned out to be, uh, if anything, uh, a little bit conservative, and that the performance of the IMS on the one hand, but also the other monitoring capabilities of the scientific community at large, both of those are much stronger than anyone ha had justice perhaps to, to anticipate. And so in combination now more than ever, the sense is that uh, the, the treaty is effectively verifiable in the sense that uh, was originally defined by Paul Nietzsche as uh, the, the verification is adequate to prevent a militarily significant threat to emerge as a result of following the treaty, of accepting and ratifying the treaty.